lines right you see that in turn but it's still maintained on a certain kind of thinner frame right that when it's applied cross-racially right there's this notion of being like let's take a simple word fat and fat right p-h-a-t f-a-t right that still resonate very differently you hear them you hear the same thing right but this notion of being curvy or being something is still locked into a certain kind of racial ideal the fact that people perceive kim kardashian as appropriating blackness through her body, right? The fact that she's read in that way still suggests to me that certain body types and certain features are still primarily associated with and um, expected of certain kinds of bodies, right? That she's an exception, not the more common thing. So even as she's regarded as beautiful, right, and regarded in a certain, you know, kind of limelight that crosses racial boundaries, right? There's still this context, even when she's described, like, oh, we expect her to be this curvy frame. Like, the language used around her almost forgives the fact mm -hmm. that she has this different body frame, but that she's dipped in this, right? And then if you look at the fashion industry, just as, the, as an example, right, how separate that still is. Um, just recently at Fashion Week, um, Lanvin did a whole runway show, right? And all these prints, and he's actually a designer that uses a good number of ethnic models is this term there. But at the end of the show, he had these kind of print patterns he wanted to show. And so he decided to use a group of black female body models, right, to walk down the runway. And so it's almost this weird striking thing of this group of women who all look a particular kind of way that is different to represent an appendage to what my collection is, right? Because it's still the standard, right, that these women still have these features that are associated with beauty in a very dominant sense, but just happen to be black, brown, or otherwise, right? It's not that they then challenge or are integrated into what beauty is, but in fact are the appendage of this differing kind of beauty, this other space of beauty, right? It still reinforces the notion of othering. And so in that sense, there's still these kind of disparate understandings of what beauty is, both of which are equally dangerous for <laughs> bodies across the board. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so with the development of new media, you said kind of like the 70s kind of turning point in a way. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think it's heading now? Where do you think it's going to go? Do you think that we're going to be able to um, to fix these kind of issues? And what can we do on an independent level to help that? I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I really don't know. But I think that the internet and these other kinds of forms create, create forms, right? for authorial bodies to exist in ways that they didn't before, right? So that there are different ways in which someone could use a YouTube or could use Twitter or could use Facebook to think about different perceptions of the body, right? That you are not necessarily now going through the same gatekeepers, let's say, of a Viacom to say what can be performed and what would be there. The popularity of Sierra's video <clears throat> came mainly through YouTube, right? Because it was banned on these major stations, that YouTube is the place in which you saw this. Right? So you actually have these faces, and I mean, I know everybody's familiar with kind of videos that get uploaded to YouTube and end up with millions of hits, right, that's circulating. You tweet about them, you put it on your Facebook wall, you <laughs> blog about it, right? That there are these kind of spaces where still limited access, because clearly not everybody in the world has these, right? So it still inscribes certain power dynamics about what bodies will ever be represented. But granted, more access to another kind of audience to think about different performances sexuality and erotic performance, right? That don't necessarily have to be policed in the same way if we think about these kind of mainstream, a magazine, print culture, or television network, right? That you do have outlets for pretty much, you know, a good number of people to be available and to be accessible as your audience and as spectators. And then what that means in terms of 
private viewership versus public viewership, right? We're talking about an increasing amount of literature that has to be done around what it means that now the way in which we involve the public and the body in public is in private, right? That somehow the private and the public are really enmeshed in certain ways by technology. And to think about the kind of work that we're doing around that to see how certain bodies fit into that, right? And then we have to talk about things like digital divide and who has access and then what bodies are represented within that, right? But in doing so, there are these, you know, kind of opportunities in these moments to think about new possibilities within those media forms. I have a question, and I know it's because it's after one million. 